Just do it. So sometimes you work in advertising. You get a product that's really garbage, and you have to make it seem fantastic, something that's essential to continue the quality of life. Like what? Once I had to do an ad for the hair conditioner. Strategy was add softness, you can feel body, you can see. But the thing is, this is a lousy product. Uh, it made your hair sticky and in focus groups, women hated it. It also reeked, it made your hair smell like a combination of bubblegum and lip sole. But somehow I had to make people feel that it was the best hair condition ever created. I had to make, give it an image as both beautiful and sexy, approachable and yet inspirational. Advertising makes everything seem better than it actually is. That's why it's such a perfect career for me. Initially based on giving people full sensations. Few people know how to do that as well as I do. Because I've been applying these basic advertising principles my many years, my life, my life for years. When I was thirteen, my crazy mother gave me away. My lunatic psychiatrist who adopted me. I then lived a life of squalor, paedophiles, no school, and free pills. When I finally escaped, I presented myself to advertising agencies as a self-educated, slightly eccentric youth, filled with passion, bursting with ideas. I left. Out the idea I didn't know how to spell. I've been given blowjobs since I was 13. So many people get the advert- into advertising when they're 19. With no education beyond an elementary school and no connections. Just, but not just everyone can walk in off the street, become a copywriter, get to sit around in a glossy back, back table, saying things like, maybe we can get Molly Greenwood to be a voiceover, be really hip and MTV-ish. But then I was 19, and exactly what I wanted, and exactly what I got, which made me feel that I had control the world with my mind. I do not believe that I landed a job as a junior copywriter on National Potato Board at, age of, at the age of 19. For $17,000 a year, which is an astonishing fortune compared to 9000 I made two years before as a waiter in a ground room. This is a great thing about advertising. Ad people don't care where you come from, who your par- parents were. Doesn't matter. You could have this cool space under the kitchen floor. Feel with little girls' bones as long as you can dream of a better truck work and commercial you're in. I'm now 24 years old. I try to not think about a past. It seems important to think only in my job and my future, especially since advertising dictates that you're only as good as the last ad. A theme of forward momentum runs through my, ad, many advert campaigns. A body in motion tends to stay in motion. Reebok, chat, day. Just do it, wrote Nick, wrote Griffin and Kennedy. Damn, it, something isn't right. Me, to my bathroom mirror at 38. 4.30 in the morning, when I'm really, really placid. It's Tuesday evening, I'm home. I've been home for 20 minutes and been going through the mail. Then I open a bill. It freaks me out. For some reason, I have trouble writing checks. I sign this act to the last possible moment. Usually once my account has gone into a collection. It's not that I can't afford the bills. It can, I can. It's that I panic when faced with responsibility. I'm not used to the rules of structure. So I have a hard time keeping the phone connected and electricity stone on. Turned on. I place all my bills in a letter in a box and keep next to the stove. Personal letters, cards get slipped into space to the computer and my desk and the printer. My phone rings. I get a machine. I let the machine pick up. Hi, it's Jim. Just wanted to know if you want to go out for a quick drink. Give me a call and try, but try and get back. As I picked up the machine, screeches like a Strangle cat. Yes, definitely. Ah, oh, tell him. My blood alcohol level is dangerously low. See, see the tavern at nine, he says. See the tavern is at the University 12th. I'm the 10th and 3rd, just a few blocks away. Jim's over the 12th and 2nd. So it's a fulcrum between us. That's the reason why I like it. The other reason is because the martinis are known as great bowls of vodka soup. You see, you lay it, I say, you hang up. Jim is great. He's an undertaker. Actually, I suppose he's technically not an undertaker. Anymore, he's graduated a coffin salesman. Or as he puts it, pre-arrangements. A funeral business is rife with if, 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 if enthusiasms in 
funeral business, nobody actually dies. They simply move on. It's a travelling to a different time zone. He wears vintage Hawaiian shirts, even in winter. Looking at him, you think he's just a normal blue-collared Italian guy. Like maybe he's a cop or owns a pizza place, but he's an undertaker through and through. Last year, for my birthday, he gave me two bottles. One was filled with pink, pretty pink lotion. The other was an amber fluid, permaglow, and restorative amberlin fluids. It's a sort of conversation, please. You can't find a pottery barn. I'm not so shallow to pick my friends based on what they do for a living. But in this case, I have to say, it's a major selling point. A few m- m- hours later, I just walked into Caesar Tavern and felt immediately at ease. There's a huge old bar to a right ca- carved by hand a century ago from several ancient oak trees, like this great big middle finger aimed at a nat- at nature's conserv- conservationist. Behind the bar, all was panelled in the same wood, inlaid in tall etched mirrors. Next to the mi- mirrors are dull brass light fixtures which stain glass shadows. Shades, no bulb and places above 25 watts. And over here there are nice tall wooden booths and oil paintings of English bird dogs and anonymous grandfathers posing on burglary leather back wing chairs. They serve a kind of food. Here, chicken, fried steak, fish and chips, cheeseburgers and a very lame salad that features iceberg lettuce and croutons from a box. I could live here. And if I hadn't, if it's, if I hadn't already, even though I'm five minutes early, Jim's sitting at the bar and already halfway through my tinny. Well, what's a fucking lash, I say? How have you been? How long have you been here? I was thirsty about in a minute. He appears to be eyeing a woman who is sitting alone at a table in a jukebox. She wears cocky sacks, a pink and white striped Oxford cloth shirt, and a white wee box. I instantly peg her as an off-duty nurse. She's not your type, I say. He gives me the, how do you, how do you know, look? Our minor, look at what she's drinking, coffee. He glances, take, looks down from her, and takes another sip of his drink. Look. I can't stay put. Uh, I couldn't stay out last night because I have to be the Met tomorrow morning at nine. A Met? He asks incredulously. Why the Met? I roll my eyes, wag my fingers in the air to get the bartender's attention. My clients, Fabergé, are creating a new perfume. They want the ad eventually to join them tomorrow morning and see the Fabergé egg expedition as inspiration of them. I order a kennel, a one martini straight up with an olive. Use a good tiny green olives here. I like that. I despise the big fat olives. They make up too much space. They take up too much space in the glass. So, I'm here to be here to, in a suit and look at those fucking eggs all morning. We're going to be get together the day of tomorrow, you see. Have a terrific meeting about the senior management. See the global vision thing? One of those, things, those awful meetings you dread for weeks in advance. I take the first sip of my martini. It feels exactly right, like a part of my own psychology. God, I hate my job. You should get a real job, Jim tells me. This advertising stuff stuff is putrid. You spend your days waltzing around the mitt looking at fabricry eggs. You take make words of cash and all you do is complain. Jesus, you're not even 25 yet. He sticks his thumb and index in the glass and pinches the olive, which he then pops into his mouth. I watch him do this and can't get, can't help but think. Places those thing, things have been. Why don't you try selling a 68-year-old widow in the Bronx her own coffin? We had that conf- this conversation before many times. And to think of his spirit to me, and actually he is. He's a certainty janitor in a drum. He provides a service. I, on the other hand, try to trick or manipulate people into parting with their money. And it's a service. Yeah, yeah, order us but another round. I'm going to take a leak. I walk off to the men's room, leaving him at the bar. Have four more drinks at Caesar Tavern before and five, just enough to feel loose and comfortable. My own skin like a gym mess. Jim suggests we meet at another bar. I check my watch at almost 10.30. I should head home now. I go to sleep. I'm so fresh in the morning. But then I think, okay, that's the latest I can do, get to sleep and still okay. 
I'll be there at nine. I should be up at nine, seven thirty, so I mean, so I should get to my bed by later then. No, later then. I give the count of my fingers because I can not do maths, let alone in my head. Twenty, thirty. Where do you want to go? I ask him. I don't know. Let's just walk. I say, okay. We head outside. As soon as I step into the fresh air, something in my brain oxidizes. I feel like a slightly st- bit tipsy. Not drunk. Not even close. Though I certainly wouldn't attempt to operate a cotton gin. You end up walking down the street for two blocks and heading into this place at the corner that sometimes plays live jazz. Tim's telling me that an absolute worst thing you can encounter is an Undertaker in a jumper. Two kettle, one mantinis, straight up with olives, I tell the bartender, and he then turn to Jim. What's so bad about jumpers? What? I love this man. Because you move their limbs, a bones are all broken, a slide through around loose inside the skin, and make this sort of your know, drinks arrived. He takes a sip and continues. This sort of rumbling sound. There's no fucking... That's so fucking horrifying, I say, delighted. What else? He takes another sip, ceases his forehead and thought, OK, I know you love this. It's so... Uh, it's a guy, a tummy tie, string around the end of a dick, so that's what it won't leak. Won't, won't leak piss. Jesus, I said. We both take a sip from our drinks. I notice sips more gulp. I need another drink soon. Martini's now is shamefully meagre. OK, give me one more horrible, I tell him. He tells me how once he had a female body, a deprecated head, and a female and the family insisted on open a casket surface. Can you imagine? So he broke a bone stick in half and jammed it down through the neck and into the meat as I've thought so. He stuck the head on to the other end, the other the stick, and pushed, kind of pushed it. And pushed, wow, I say. He's done things that most people death row have done. He smiles with what I think to be fried. I put him, I put her in a white cashmere toe neck, and she actually ended up looking goody good. He winks at me, pucks an olive from my drink. I do not take another sip from the tip of the glass. We have always Maybe five drinks before I check my watch again. There's a quarter of one. I really need to go. It happened already in a mess, as it is. But that's, that, that's not what happens. What happens is Jim orders his nightcap. Just one more shot of camera for luck. The very next, last thing I remember is standing on the stage at karaoke bar. Somewhere in the west of the village, the spotlights are shining in my face. I'm trying to read a old video man in front of me. And while he was scrolling the words, the theme for the Brady Bunch, I see double, and as I close one eye. But then I do, did lose my balance and stagger. Jim's laughing like a madman in the front row, pounding the table with his hands. The floor trips me. I fall. The bartender walks me from behind the bar and scoops me off stage. His arm feels good around my shoulders. I give him a friendly nuzzle, or some, perhaps a kiss on the mouth. Fortunately, I didn't. I don't do this. Fortunately, I don't do this. Outside the bar, I look at my watch and slur. This can't be right. I leaned against Jim's shoulder so he didn't fall over to the, on a tricky sidewalk. What, he says, grinning. It's a thin plastic drink straw, but behind each ear, the straws are red and irons chewed. I raise my arm to my watch. It's almost pressed against his nose. Look, I say. He pushes my arm back so he can read and dial. Yanks! Why, why, how that happened? Are you sure it's right? Watch reads 4.15 a.m. Impossible. I wonder aloud, why is it displaying the time in Europe instead of Manhattan? <laughs>